Hi there, welcome to episode 3. Today we'll assemble this table full of guitar parts into a working instrument. Arguably uh, the most fun part of the process, right? Let's get into it. Up front, before we start, on old archtop guitars like this, and especially uh, when you've never seen what they do under string tension, as I have with this one, there are two main effects that could happen. The most common one would be um, the, the neck, bolted on here in the neck pocket, slightly rotating or bending upwards by string tension and uh, thereby creating what appears to be a high action, which means you would have to lower the bridge to account for that. But then there's the second effect, depending on how the guitar is constructed on some, the top will sink down more or less and thereby dropping the bridge. And in this case, you would have to increase the height on the bridge to raise it up. And we don't really know what will happen with this one. Sometimes, um, if you're lucky, those effects will cancel out, but mostly one of them will be stronger than the other. And before I go uh, all in and assemble all the electronics and all the stuff, I want to do a minimal thing where I just install um, the least parts needed to put strings on it. This will be obviously the neck, the tuning machines, the tailpiece, and the bridge. It's usually a good idea to apply just a tiny bit of wax to a fastener to prevent it from rusting in place in the years to come. Give it a turn in reverse until you feel it engaging in the threads and then drive it in. For the little holder of the trapeze tailpiece, which is actually a little vibrato system, I decided to pull out the spring and use it as a hardtail, or not really a hardtail, but just a regular trapeze tailpiece, which will give me a lot better tuning stability. And I have no intention of making this super long bar, the handlebar that would be needed for this. I have no intention of using it anyway, so yeah. Let's get rid of the spring here. I mean, no, don't worry. I will keep it, obviously. I will not toss it in the bin. This will be kept in the case with the guitar. I will also install a ground wire, which this guitar did appear to have originally, although there is this convenient hole hidden behind the tailpiece. But it certainly won't hurt to have it. I put some fishing line on here for the outside E-strings to try and figure out the alignment and also the best string spacing at the bridge here so I can file the slots. Now I'll test with uh, some real strings.
All right, I left it strung up like this and tuned to pitch for a few days just to see what would happen. Because who knows, this thing probably didn't have any tension on it for, for years, maybe decades, just sitting in some uh, wet basement. <laughs> so I wanted um, to get a sense of how the neck would move, how the body would deform before I go any further on this one. My initial impression, just strumming it uh, acoustically like this for a few days, I really like it. I didn't expect that. It sounds really nice. You get that typical mid-rangey resonance you would expect from a hollow body. And I think it really plays much more comfortable than I would have imagined, given how bulky and almost cumbersome this can look and like this almost square neck profile here but it plays really nicely i think um putting all this effort into the frets really paid off here of course it still plays like a very old guitar but it's actually comfortable and i really enjoy playing it i decided to go with a, just a light set of strings regular um, 10 gauge on this one those were probably designed for heavier gauges back then, but yeah, I just wanted to feel it out before I put heavier gauges on there. The first things I noticed on the deflection side, the neck is really dead straight. It really pays off uh, for them to use this massive chunky profile. The truss rod is completely loose. I didn't need to tighten it at all and the neck is completely straight. Almost no relief in there. I'm almost buttoned out on the height adjust here, so um, it might be a good idea to adjust the neck angle a tiny bit so it, I just get a little bit more of adjustment room on the bridge here. But as it sits now, it plays pretty comfortably, at least for me. Um, I like my action to be more on the high side of things, but still it's always good to have some adjustment room and not set up a guitar with... Um, an adjustment range buttoned out, bottomed out. Next thing I noticed, um, the tailpiece on this vibrato system is actually moving much more than I would like. See, this is what it looks like without a spring. It works perfectly fine, but I should put uh, maybe not the spring, but some type of spacer instead of the spring in there, just to get this a little bit further down towards the edge of the body and thereby increase the brake angle on the bridge a little bit. Maybe not essential, but this looks kind of weird to me. Not much room on those tuning posts. Like three windings is pushing it. Right now the action is just over 1.5, maybe 1.6 millimeters on the 12th fret here. And I consider this really well playable for a guitar like that. Straight edge on top of the frets. And at the bridge position under tension, we get about 21 and a half millimeters. And now we will check that without the strings on for comparison, how much the top actually sinks in. And back to the straight edge, without string tension, we get pretty much exactly the same measurement of 21 and a half. That's interesting. This is pretty much what I talked about when I said sometimes the effect of a slightly sinking top and a slightly rotating neck block can cancel out each other. But yeah. Regarding electronics, the original schematic for this guitar can be found online. And this is actually a pretty weird circuit. Um, I think since this is all original, I will put it in like that and try out these weird four positions and maybe, I mean, if it's totally unusable, I could always change this to a more regular volume and tone and maybe even wire this um, like a four-way switch in a tally you sometimes find where you have just bridge both neck and then like a, a fourth position with series and parallel. But for now, I mean... I think we should at least try the original configuration before we mess with it, right?
Okay, the pickups are soldered back uh, onto the wiring harness. Sorry, no footage of that. I needed all of my two hands to do it. And I added the new ground wire onto the output jack. Just put a switch on here so I can physically move that. And I think we can have a little test now. So let's plug it in. And the moment of truth. Bridge pickup. This should be a uh, both. Yeah. This should be banjo, so just the bridge. Nothing here. And the next one should be just the neck. Okay, we have working pickups. Fantastic. Now let's uh, put it all together, put strings on it and do the final testing on a real amplifier. Oh, that's great. The pick guard was originally mounted with these rubber spacers. It's fun that the old owner didn't keep the pick guard, but he kept uh, the spacers. In fact, uh, those are responsible for those uh, crazy discolorations here in the finish. I will keep these, but uh, for now I will install it using just some pieces of silicon tubing as spacers. This should do the trick. To replace the spring in the vibrato system and basically make it a hard tail, I made this little uh, spacer here from a steel tube. It has an angle filed in the end, just painted it black so it doesn't stand out too much. And it fits into um, the milling in the top part, like that. That's it. It will just stay in place. String tension will push it down towards the body. And then it's locked there. That's it. Last bolt went in, or less screw in this case. Finished guitar. Let's set it up, tune it, and plug it in. <laughs> Thank you. 
let's plug into the next amplifier and hear some distorted crunchy sounds, right? initially given how big and almost square the neck profile is but I got used to it really quickly obviously the circuit is um, kind of unusual and takes some getting used to instead of your usual volume and tone you basically get this four-way switch and a master, a master volume control and this is a volume control for just one of these positions that acts like a preset in this case and I think the way to look at it is how, how I feel um, it works at least in the position where this switch is in line with the pods like this and this is what they call the solo position and in my opinion like the main bass sound of the guitar where you have both pickups in parallel and you can switch upwards to get to the rhythm position in this case you have just the bridge pickup with the preset volume, so you can dial it down a little bit. And those are wired in a way where it um, cuts a lot of treble. So this guitar can be quite bright and jangly, and by just rolling it down one notch, uh, you can take uh, some of the sharp edge of it and make it a little bit rounder and warmer and step uh, back in the mix a little bit. And then on the other side of the home position, you have the banjo mode, which is like, super sharp and it's basically the bridge pickup again with a high pass filter and then finally you have the weird shearing mode i don't exactly know what it means <laughs> it's just the neck pickup with a um, large capacitor acting as a low pass so yeah this this very dull almost bass guitar type sound this is in my opinion maybe the uh, least useful 
position. I might go in there and remove the capacitor so I get um, at least a posi one position where I can just play the next pickup on its own. But yeah, overall, pretty happy. Also acoustically, if you just drum it like that, has uh, some, some acoustic volume going on there. Okay, we've heard clean sounds, some overdrive sounds, and now it's time for the third amplifier that I got sitting here. And this one is pretty special. This is a Vermona Regent 300K. And if you're wondering why it says GA60 guitar amplifier, that's because this one here is actually the export version. You could buy this in West Germany, for example, from some catalog brands that had their stuff made in Eastern Germany. Or uh, actually they just sold like rebranded OEM stuff. It's pretty interesting actually. It's a solid state amplifier. But if you look at it, you have two inputs going on on the left. And on top, the controls volume, bass, middle, travel are pretty much uh, self-explanatory. With the exception of the middle control, which has like an off position. So you can click off the mids entirely. And if you turn it on, you have the regular EQ. This is kind of weird. I don't completely understand how it works, but we can try it. And if you plug into the second input, the volume and everything works as well. But you have um, the optional fuzz control and there is uh, like a two transistor fuzz circuit built in here. And this is like a blend pot. So you have uh, like full clean signal. And if you turn it up, you get um, everything routed through the fuzz. And if I believe, uh, if I'm correct, there was only one fuzz pedal for sale uh, back then in Eastern Germany. And this is called the Böhm Trickverzerrer. And I believe this is the same circuit, but I would have to look this up. Then there is a spring reverb, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't, and a tremolo. Yeah, let's try it. Thank you. 
Okay, that's it. I want to thank you so much for watching. And I hope you enjoyed it, um, especially getting a look at one of the less common guitars. That's uh, one you don't see every day for sure. So finally, is it fair to call it the East German ES330 or the East German Epiphone Casino? <laughs> yeah, not quite. I think it really is its own thing and it has to be, has to be taken for that. Especially in combination with the East German amplifier, there are some cool sounds in there. Just have to be um, open-minded for tweaking knobs, taking different approaches than usual, just experimenting. For now, I think I will leave the guitar as is in this configuration, all original. Yeah, let's embrace the weird, right? <laughs> And if you enjoyed this video, why don't you just stick around maybe by subscribing to my channel here if you haven't already. I have a bunch more restoration projects just sitting around and waiting and I will make sure to film them as well and upload them here for you to enjoy. Alright, see you next time.